All right. Uh, so just in continuation with uh, the background of the book of Acts, we've we've looked at what we the themes that we will find um, in in this uh, book. Uh, but I also quickly want to show you a map. This is. I'm not able to. Okay, I will share my entire screen. All right, I think that's the way to make this visible. Sorry, everyone, I'm not able to share. There seems to be some issue. OK, uh, please excuse me on this one. Uh, I'll uh, try and share it in the next class. Uh, so I basically wanted to show you the map of the seven churches in Asia Minor, uh, which is talked about in the book of Revelation. Uh, and you will notice that all these seven churches are in the regions where Paul did his ministry. So uh, you see, uh, whatever happened in the book of Acts, right? It, it's not, uh, it wasn't really forgotten, but uh, God chose these seven churches to talk about in the book of Revelation. And, you know, uh, Apostle John wrote uh, more about this later on. So uh, the book of Acts that way is very significant. Even the epistles, when we study the epistles, we will relate it to one or the other churches you know, that uh, the, the people in the book of Acts planted. Uh, so this is the significance and the importance of uh, this particular book. So how does this book begin? I told us that the book of Luke, he ended with the um, resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the commissioning of the disciples. So how does it pick up you know, from Acts of the Apostles onwards? So let's begin from uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, and then you know, I'll try and expound as, as much as possible um, from this chapter. You could also, if you are able, you can open up Enduring Word uh, and uh, go to the book of Acts there and begin with chapter 1. So obviously, I'm not going to go through all of David Kuzik's content, but then uh, you know some key things that he has mentioned, I, I do will mention in my explanation here. So it, uh, Acts chapter 1, it begins with, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. We see that Jesus, even after his resurrection, ministers to his own people. So primarily, his ministry was to the disciples and the believers. So Luke wrote about this. He refers to a former account I made. That is the book of Luke that he's talking about. Well, uh, the rest of Jesus' ministry is recorded. And he also has mentioned the name of the audience, which is Theophilus. And I talked about Theophilus. So he was probably a believer uh, and uh, he could have been an official uh, who was associated with the trial of Paul. So that uh, is who Theophilus is. And he tells Theophilus that, you know, I wrote an account about Jesus uh, and now he is writing about what Jesus, the resurrected Christ, is uh, doing and, and has done. So 
of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now, this is very beautiful. Now, he uh, talks about the ministry of Jesus, and it's a takeaway for us as believers and those who are in the ministry. There is an integration of doing and teaching. You know, just one wouldn't suffice. We need both. We need to do or demonstrate the works of God as much as teach the word of God. And that is the proper way of doing the ministry that God has called us to do. So we also see here that uh, the Lord Jesus, you know, he uh, made that effort to serve his people. The resurrected Christ, he could have just been happy Sometimes you wonder, Lord, why, why uh, did the resurrected Christ choose to be on the earth for, uh, you know, scriptures say 40 days he was around? Uh, Lord, what did you want to accomplish through him walking the earth? But it just tells us that God cared so much about his own people. Now He, uh, first of all, revealed to them his glory uh, through the resurrection, but he also ministered and strengthened his own people before the moment of ascension. So you know, this is how Luke writes. So I'm going to read uh, that verse one again. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So this is, uh, you know, his his uh, earthly ministry as well as you know, his uh, resurrected ministry until the day in which he was taken up. Who was taken up? Jesus was taken up. So it's talking about a definite ascension of the Lord Jesus. And Luke is giving witness to this event. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So he's saying that Jesus ministered through the Holy Spirit. Okay, amazing, right? Uh, so this is another account where we understand the setting of the trinity and there is a trinity jesus by the holy spirit jesus through the holy spirit had given commandments to the apostles so the godhead is working in harmony and in agreement and that is very obvious in the very beginning of this book so jesus working with the Holy Spirit, gave commandments or did ministry to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the apostles, again, they were chosen by the uh, decision of the Lord Jesus. And we know how he prayed and he picked these 12 men uh, and he equipped them you know, during his lifetime here on the earth, preparing them for something that is to come. So, you know, it's amazing that uh, the intention which God had was to do more than, you know, demonstrate his glory and power uh, and make his disciples dependent on him. We are dependent on him, but there's also that element of empowering us, you know, that uh, is seen in, in and through the ministry of Jesus. So those three, three and a half years seems like a very short time, isn't it? That uh, Jesus is working with these disciples, but he taught them, he built them up, he did his ministry, he demonstrated uh, the works of uh, the supernatural, but he prepared them to carry on when he's gone. So, you know, it, it's an example of, uh, uh, exemplary leadership that in just three three and a half years he has picked the people that uh, you know he trusted to be the future leaders and then he equips them enough you know to hand over uh, the work to these uh, 12 men whom he had chosen so you know, the the first two verses simply talk and describe the talk about and describe the ministry of the Lord Jesus. So before he ascended, uh, this uh, verse two says that he gave commandments to the apostles. So what kind of commandments did he give? Uh, of course, we know about the Great Commission. We know that you know he told them to um, uh, demonstrate the power of the kingdom. You know, uh, these sons will follow those that believe. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So 
the fulfilling the great commission and how to fulfill the great commission was uh, some of uh, some of the commandments that he gave his disciples now let's move right along verse 3 uh, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of god so here since it's referring to the 40 days uh, it's most definitely the the period of his resurrection um, and we are told that jesus presented himself to his disciples and he gave them sufficient proof infallible proofs so that shows us the heart of god towards us that you know god is uh, he's sort of on a convincing mode so he provides sufficient clarity to his at one point they were grieving uh, disciples because you know jesus we expected you to be some sort of a political leader uh, and uh, you know demonstrate the kingdom that you were talking about but you, know, you died and you uh, went through such a difficult trial so the disciples would have been disappointed in a way however that sorrow was quickly turned into joy because as jesus had spoken to them he resurrected on the third day but even after that you know god cared enough to provide many proofs to not just the disciples but other believers as well uh, if we look at first corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6 you know that uh, scripture uh, i will quickly read it out for us it says after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present but some have fallen asleep so jesus was seen by more than 500 people after his resurrection and you know that that uh, in itself is very encouraging that there was evidence of the resurrection of christ and not only that an additional truth that we can uh, make note of is these people who saw jesus you know uh, uh, at his resurrection if they were if they were young people the book of acts is only over a span of 30 years isn't it so when luke was writing about all that the holy spirit did through the early church these people who saw the resurrected christ were probably alive you know and they could affirm that what luke had written as a historical account is correct so the resurrection of jesus it's a historical fact and luke as a physician you know, who we would uh, uh, expect him to be very logical and intellectual a man like luke he's talking about the resurrection of christ so it's not a myth it is a historical fact and uh, uh, Luke records here that he gave infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and also Apostle Paul writes about it in 1st Corinthians 15 that uh, indeed the resurrected Christ was seen by many people now what did Jesus do during that phase when uh, he he was ministering in his resurrected body we are told very clearly okay that uh, he was speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So whenever it comes to subjects like this, you know, the ministry of the resurrected Christ, uh, people can come up with all kinds of stories and you know, obscure things that don't have uh, uh, secondary information that affirms what they are they are saying. So Luke has put it down very clearly, and he has mentioned here that the subject that Jesus taught was not uh, a new subject. Jesus, even during uh, his uh, earthly ministry as a human being, he was talking about the kingdom of God. He was wanting people to repent. Um, he was talking about heaven and hell. He was talking about, um, you know, 
many other subjects like uh, good stewardship and his teachings revolved around all of this after his resurrection he continues to talk about the things pertaining to the kingdom of god so that way it does not give opportunity for people to come up with um, you know if i may use the word weird teaching and say that oh you know this is a hidden revelation and uh, jesus was actually talking about uh, you know x y and z during his days of resurrection because the bible very clearly says that he was speaking about things pertaining to the kingdom of god which um, is a repetition of what he did during his earthly ministry so let me just pause for a moment and check with all of us are you doing okay um, uh, you could give me some feedback whether you know the pace is okay you are able to get what i'm saying or if there's any uh, any challenges that you're encountering okay so i can see here on the chat that you are doing fine okay praise god let's continue if you have any questions or you just want to interrupt to you know tell me uh, anything about the way i'm um, you know the format that i'm using please let me know so i, I can always correct to make it better for your learning all right so moving ahead right so we see we talked about these 40 days okay so again this is very interesting 40 days what 40 days uh jewish festivals of the passover and then you know the day of pentecost the duration in between is 50 days so 40 days after jesus's resurrection he appeared to more than 500 people including his own disciples and then you know uh, he ascended so there were about 10 days between the ascension of jesus and the day of pentecost where the outpouring of the holy spirit took place so Acts chapter one, Acts chapter two. Uh, the period is something like you know fifty days, fifty days, or you know uh, one and a half months uh, is the duration that we are talking about. So moving on to verse four here. Okay. So I I said that Jesus continued to minister during his period of resurrection to to his own disciples. So that's what is happening from verse four to verse eight, and being assembled together with them. he commanded them not to depart from jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said you have heard from me for john truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the holy spirit not many days from now so jesus already equipped the believers with the word of god the believers the disciples they were also we would say born again because in john chapter 20 we see him breathe on them right so after his resurrection after the work of the cross he breathes on them and he says receive ye the holy spirit till that time the disciples were not born again but once the holy spirit came to dwell within them they were now born again but even after being born again and even after being equipped with the word what is this that the resurrected jesus is talking about he is telling them don't depart from jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father so there was something more which was required for them to accomplish the commandment of the great commission what was that the promise of the father and he explains himself it, this is nice because scripture is interpreting itself which he said you have heard from me for john truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the holy spirit not many days from now so jesus is telling them that the promise of the father equals the baptism of the holy spirit which is to he gave them 
uh, an estimate. He said, not many days from now. So they knew that it is going to take place in a matter of days. And this is a requirement for us to continue to do the work that God wants us to do. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, even for believers. It's very interesting. Why is Jesus doing this? Isn't the word enough? Isn't them being born again enough? But we see here, he's telling these people, no, you need something more. And that is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I want you to wait for it in Jerusalem. Don't step out just yet. Wait for this to happen. Verse 6, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So, you know, the disciples, uh, many of us can relate to this, isn't it? Here is Jesus saying something so important, and we have our own questions. Is it related to what he said? He talked about the promise of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and here is, you know, the set of disciples asking him, Another theological doubt. They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they had their own perception of what might take place probably after the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And here is the answer that Jesus gave them and said, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority so it helps us understand as believers yes we are asking so many different questions but god has chosen to reveal what we need there are um, uh, if you want to term it as unrevealed you know unrevealed mysteries that even if we approach god with those questions he feels that hey you know you really don't have to whatever i have told you Till now is sufficient for you. So you can um, work with that. He had spoken so much with the disciples about the kingdom of God and how the kingdom comes and how they need to move with the uh, authority which is given to them. So he had actually already spoken about the kingdom and he had made statements, you know, uh, about the uh, kingdom being with them and the kingdom coming. But still, the disciples had a doubt about the literal kingdom of Israel. Now, obviously, they, they knew from scripture that there would be a time when the literal kingdom of Israel will also be restored. But for some reason, you know, Jesus did not find it important to answer their question with the kind of clarity that they wanted at that point in time. So he simply tells them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So there are certain things that the Father alone knows. And if we go searching for those uh, mysteries, answers to those mysteries, it's likely that we may not uh, you know, get the information. So for us to know everything is not possible. It's only what God has chosen to reveal to us. And in this case, the disciples were not given the date and time of the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. So he comes back to the point he was making about the promise of the Father, which is most important for the disciples at that in that season. Okay, probably even they did not understand the importance of it, but he goes back, refocus, and he says, Okay, that you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So uh, I'll quickly share with us. Okay. Right. So, yeah. So the word witnesses there in the Greek, it is the word martus. Okay. Martus, um, uh, it, it refers to a martyr. You shall be my witnesses in all of Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. So interesting. 
it's the word matos from the Greek, uh, which means a martyr. So what is Jesus saying? Now, is he saying that uh, those who follow him, those who are baptized in the Holy Spirit will all become martyrs? In the case of the disciples, you know, most of them it happened, isn't it? But the point that Jesus was making, it's not, the, not a literal martyr. That's not what it means. It simply means surrender. You know, a martyr, what, what is the uh, characteristic of a martyr? A martyr gives it all for the cause. And in the same way, he is letting the, the disciples know that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses in that manner, that life that is yielded to the work of the Holy Spirit, where the power of the Holy Spirit is revealed uh, to such an extent. So, you know, it's, it's surrender. It's surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus was telling them, that when you wait in Jerusalem, you know, another few days, you shall, you shall receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the disciples needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, or in other words, they needed a separate experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit to bear witness to the resurrection power of Christ to the ends of the earth. And Jesus knew that very well. And he knew that that was the subject of importance at that point in time. And he's telling them, please wait, receive this. Then you will be able to do what I asked you to do. Without that, it will be very difficult for you to be a witness for me. So he speaks to them uh, about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And later on, verse 9, uh, Luke writes, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. We could just talk about the theological aspects of this one scripture. Okay, uh, Basically, it's about the ascension of the Lord Jesus uh, after he had spoken of all the important things which he wanted to. You know, when somebody is um, leaving home or you know out to going to travel they they usually uh, let us know give us those important instructions isn't it because they know that these things are very important okay the keys are kept here switch off the lights do this do that and more so when someone's completing their journey if someone's leaving an organization or if, if someone knows that they're at the end of their life uh, here on earth, they will reveal what is most important to the people who are left behind. And we see that Jesus continued to talk about the things pertaining to the kingdom. He did not find it so important to uh, talk about the timing of the restoration of the kingdom or of the nation of Israel, but instead he focused on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it was that important for the ascending Christ to make mention of this to his disciples. And so once he had spoken about these things, scriptures say, while they watched, he was taken up. Quite dramatic. A cloud received him out of their sight. So, you know, we can imagine this, right? Jesus, he just spoke to his disciples, he was with them, and then, you know, he's being lifted up. Okay, it's supernatural. Uh, and they, they are watching Jesus being taken up. Uh, and finally, you know, a cloud comes and receives him and he disappears. And they understood that, you know, Jesus in his resurrected body has now entered a different realm or a different soul and we know from the rest of scripture that he seated at the right hand of the father um, until the day that he comes back so he's still there but just that he's not here on earth in his resurrected body he is up there in heaven now we might ask why is it that uh, god even thought of letting the disciples see 
the ascension of Jesus. You know, why not? Uh, maybe after all the meetings that Jesus had with the disciples, he could have just disappeared, isn't it? And the disciples could have said, oh, I think Jesus has ascended. Okay? And that would have been fine with all of them because Jesus would have told them that one day I am going to the Father. But God is very wise in the way he orchestrates um, you know, events. The ascension of Jesus before the eyes of the disciples ensured that they all had evidence to what had taken place. Otherwise, you know, the disciples could have come up with all kinds of parallel stories and said, oh no, no Jesus is here, Jesus is there. Yeah, sorry, I can hear something. Okay, right. So to avoid that, it was a very uh, clear event. The ascension of Jesus and him being received uh, up by the cloud. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why are you why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will soon come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Okay, again, through the wisdom of God, while the disciples thought that whatever has happened till now, it, it has great bearing you know, on our lives. And we just want to focus on the ministry of Jesus, the teachings of the resurrected, resurrected Jesus, the signs and wonders of uh, you know, Jesus uh, through the entire time and his ascension. They just wanted to focus on that. And it would have been easier for them to do that at that point in time. And God you know, really spoke to their hearts. And it says there were two men who stood by them in white apparel. Again, there's, there's contention about who these two men are. Uh, you know, uh, scholars say that these two men uh, were Moses and Elijah uh, who appeared uh, at that time. Or some scholars say, no, no, they, they were just angels who spoke to uh, the disciples. But whoever they were, you know, they brought godly wisdom. And they told the disciples, stop staring at the past. You have work to do. What Jesus needed to do, he has done. And now he has ascended up into heaven. You go do your part. Stop being um, like fixated on what has just happened. Right? So they were being awakened to the call of God on their life. It was as if Jesus passed the, you know, baton or baton, however you want to call it, and he was telling the disciples, it's your turn now. You need to go and you need to fulfill the great commission through your lives. And we know that, you know, that's not just applicable to the disciples. It's so applicable for us. We can read the Bible. We can um, meditate on scripture and say, oh, how wonderful. You know, I'm coming to know God and all. That's, that's great. It's really beautiful. And that's how it should be. We have to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But also, we have a work to do. We need to go and do our part for the kingdom of God. And the book of Acts, uh, as I have shared earlier, is that. It's the evidence of the power of God through the lives of believers who stepped out. So it was a call to step out and do what God called them to do. And notice here, you know, another very encouraging uh, point is uh, we are told this same Jesus. So there's no doubt in who ascended and who's going to come back. So the way the disciples saw Jesus go up into heaven, they were assured this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. You know? And uh, that is such a highlight for us as believers, the second coming of Christ. We are going to see him come back in glory. 
you know and that is an encouragement as we go ahead and do what god is calling us to do so all of this you know uh, uh, unfolded um, in in those um, moments when uh, jesus was uh, reassuring them and uh, he ascended so let me pause for a moment and uh, look at all of us here um, so yeah what thoughts are running through your minds Is there anything that you know really touched you from what we have seen so far? Okay. So you're probably just digesting, um, you know, all of this. Uh, we'll we'll continue then. Uh, let me look at the following verses here from verse twelve. Uh, so after Jesus was taken up, and they uh, the disciples had the assurance that this same Jesus is going to come back in the same way, uh, they return to Jerusalem from the. Mount of Olives. So Jesus was taken up from the Mount of Olives, um, and uh, it was a Sabbath day's journey, so you know, it, it was not too far. And they come and return to Jerusalem. And when they entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. So there was this this place known as the upper room where the disciples uh, were, along with other believers. So then you had the list of the disciples. It's listed out for us. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Okay, So we have all those uh, disciples whom Jesus had chosen except for Judas Iscariot. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So very interesting again that you have the disciples, you have some other disciples, okay, women. It just says, and uh, with the women, you also have the mother of Jesus and the brothers of Jesus. And if you remember, the brothers of Jesus were not that supportive of uh, Jesus. In his earthly ministry, they had lots of questions about whether he is the Messiah. And Jesus said, that, you know, people who are familiar with us don't see the call of God on our lives. So, you know, he made statements like that because his own people and his own family had trouble accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, for the fact that he was the Messiah. So let me quickly refer. Yeah, so John 7 5 uh, is a, a reference that you could jot down. Mark 3 21 um, is another reference where you see that his brothers were not supportive at all. Uh, but what happened to these people after the resurrection? You see, even the resurrection you know, proved. To his own family that we were actually walking with the Messiah and the Messiah was part of our household. So they came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that is so valuable, isn't it? So all of these disciples with some other disciples, the family of Jesus, they all came back to Jerusalem and they came to this place called the upper room and what are they doing? What they knew to do best which is to pray and to seek God. So scriptures also tell us that they were in one accord. Okay? And um, yeah, just. Yes. Okay, in the Greek, this word one accord is homo tumadon. Okay, so uh, one accord is 
together, united. So they were united in prayer. That uh, is the understanding from what we see here. So we can imagine how Jesus has ascended and the disciples come back and they are in one accord. Why are they in one accord? You know, they just heard the instruction of Jesus that in a few days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. So they were aware that there is a promise that we are living for. And while they were waiting for the promise, what did they choose to do as a community? They prayed. You know, when we are aware of the promises of God, sometimes we uh, just want to dismiss ourselves and say, okay, God is sovereign. He will do what he needs to do. There's no need for me to pray. But you see the posture that the believers took even after they knew what God was going to do through their lives. That God would send the Holy Spirit. God would make them witnesses to the ends of the earth. You know, they chose to pray. They chose to seek God. And so they were in an they were in a posture of obedience. They were in a posture of worship. They were in a posture of prayer, seeking the Lord. And then, you know, uh, at that point, we we see that Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. And uh, scripture records here uh, that the number of names was about 120. So 120 disciples had gathered together. Peter stood up in the midst of them. Why did Peter stand up? You know, again, you would see in the book of Acts that God works through people. Now, sometimes uh, people say, use this people. Okay. But use this people doesn't sound very good. Uh, God works through people. God also works through who we are naturally. So Peter, if you know the way he uh, behaved earlier, he was just quick to talk. He was quick to give his opinion. Uh, and somehow you see that God continued to use him for who he was. And Peter quite naturally takes leadership in this case. And thankfully, you know, after the resurrection of Jesus, before the resurrection of Jesus, he was a coward. He escaped uh, the scene when Jesus was being tried. But there was a real and genuine transformation in the heart of Peter. God also, Jesus also comforts him uh, after his resurrection. So now Peter is courageous. He is, um, you know, his, his heart is, if you want to call, undivided. He's very focused. He takes on leadership and it comes naturally to him. So he just stands up in the midst of these 120 believers uh, or disciples and uh, you know, he he quotes from the uh, scriptures. He says, men and brethren, I'm at verse 16. This scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Okay. So Peter realizes that as scriptures mention, you know, Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. So then he goes on. He goes on to describe what happened to Judas. He says that uh, uh, he, he sold Jesus and then he got the wages of uh, his work, which is he died by uh, falling to the ground. And, you know, the, the gory details are also mentioned over there. Uh, and, you know, he says that now that he is gone we need to pick someone else in that office so i'll read from verse 20 for it is written in the book of psalms let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it so he's talking about judas and let another take his office so peter for some reason he knew that what judas did no, it was already spoken about in scripture, but it is now time for another person to take that position because Jesus wanted 12 disciples. Okay, so uh, he goes ahead with uh, leading the choice of somebody in the place of 
Judas. So from verse 21, therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So Peter says, we are going to choose, but we are going to choose from this uh, inner circle. There were 120 people and Peter was well aware of the men and women who had walked with Jesus through his ministry and who also were with uh, Jesus, you know, during that period when he was resurrected. So he did not want to pick somebody who was an outsider. So he wanted to pick somebody who was an insider. So at that point, you know, uh, it, it's like an election time. And uh, we are told that two names were proposed. Joseph, called Barsabas, uh, whose surname was Justice, and Matthias. So two people were proposed. Uh, and then you know, the people prayed together, asked God who uh, God would want to take the place of Judas. And then we are told that they cast lots. And Matthias was the one on whom the lot fell. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So in chapter 1, what do we see? We see the instructions of Jesus before his ascension. We see the ascension of Jesus. Then we see the obedience of the disciples in going back to Jerusalem and uh, maintaining a posture of prayer and worship. We see the rising up of Peter as one of the uh, leaders of the early church. We also see the choice of Matthias led by the Holy Spirit and prayer of the disciples. So uh, we will stop here and we will pick up from Acts chapter 2 in the next class. Uh, we have uh, about three minutes here. So we'll quickly um, take up any questions. Yeshri Kumar, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I just uh, have a, a small doubt. Um, okay. uh, like in the book of Acts, uh, it says he, the Peter says that uh, we have to uh, pick someone uh, who was with us from the beginning, and uh, and uh, we uh, again, uh, you know, um, and it means that uh, I just want to know that Matthias' name was suddenly coming uh, in the book of uh, Acts chapter uh, in the Acts. Uh, before that, uh, even when the uh, disciples' name is mentioned, hello. Okay, Ashley Kumar, we lost your voice there. Uh, is yeah, yeah, it's okay. 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 Uh, gone again, actually. Uh, Pastor, can I? Can I is it yeah, it's like interrupted. Uh, is it audible? Yes, yes, is it yes. Audible? Yeah, you can quickly make your point. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I want to know that uh, you know the Matthias name uh, comes uh, in the book of Acts, but um, before that, if you read uh, the entire gospel, you were never able to find the name of uh, Matthias. And uh, um, second thing. And uh, even the uh, the Peter is saying that someone who was from the beginning. It means that uh, Matthias was Matthias was someone who was from the beginning. And um, so even when we uh, read about uh, read uh, when Jesus was establishing the Lord's table, when um, we think maybe it's maybe I'm, I may be wrong also. We think that it is only twelve disciples were there. So is it possible that uh, all these other disciples whose name was not mentioned, they were also there at the time of uh, Lord's table? Because uh, Paul is, Peter is saying that someone who was from the beginning means uh, like uh, how Matthias' name was there and so many other disciples were also there whose name was not mentioned. And uh, what we are assuming that only 12 disciples, 12 apostles were only there at the time of communion. Uh, I just want to ask you. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. Shri Kumar, uh, would it be okay if I answered your question uh, in the next class? 
because uh, we've we've uh, we've run out of time. That is the first thing, and also very specifically, you asking me if Matthias was Matthias was there at the communion. I think I'll have to study this a little more to to give you an answer. So I just don't want to say something. Okay. So yeah, I am assuming you'd be okay with that. So let's wrap up class. Um, I'm okay, Mr. Will... Okay. Sure. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your grace. Uh, Father God, we we continue to commit ourselves, Lord, and we uh, ask that, Lord, you will you will reveal your heart, Lord, through the acts of the apostles to us, Father God. And Lord, uh, I pray that each one be strengthened, that each one be empowered by your Holy Spirit, Father God. Lord, we give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend and we shall meet again in our next week. God bless.